Hello, my name is Adam Stockholm from Long & McQuaid. As part of our month-long band and orchestra promotion, we are pleased to offer a series of virtual workshops to engage and inspire musicians of all levels. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. He is a world-renowned performer, educator, and clinician, and founder of The Hammer Band, a not-for-profit organization that has helped thousands of at-risk youth throughout the GTA through the power of music. Now, please join me in a warm virtual welcome for Moshe Hammer. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so delighted to be here today because music and violin has been part of my life since, since I'm six, just a few years ago. And um, I do love talking about both of them. I just, uh, just love it. Um, I would like to, uh, to start by something quite generic. What is sound? Because music, as far as I'm concerned, is sound. So what happens when we produce a sound on violin or piano? Or what happens when we talk? What happens when we hear a truck on the streets or a train passing by? What is actually sound? And what makes a musical sound special is that it is a continuous vibration. For instance, if we take A, A vibrates at 440 times per second. And there's an A. No matter what instrument plays it, that will always be an A. If we hear a truck, if we hear a train, if we hear any noise from the outside, it's not a musical sound. It does move the air, but it's definitely not a musical sound. So the idea is, as far as I'm concerned, to produce a sound which is beautiful. To me, a beautiful sound is what it's all about. And let me give you an example. If you think of some people that you know, I'm sure you can easily think of one where you love to hear their voice when they speak. And vice versa, think of a person that you may not like their voice so much. That also happens. And why is that? We'll talk about that in one second. Give me, give me one moment and I will show you some amazing things. In order to make the string vibrate on a violin, I need to move the string. If the string does not vibrate, there's no sound. A pianist has to hit a key, and that key in turn hits, moves the hammer, which hits the string and makes that string vibrates. What about wind instruments? Wind instruments are fascinating because we make the vibration with the air and then we change it both by some fingerings, but we actually change it by the mouth positioning, by the embouchure. But in every case where we make a beautiful sound, that's what we want to achieve. And how do we do that? Now here comes the, the crux of the matter. How do we play, how do we get to a beautiful sound. 
<clears throat> Let me go back to the voice because voice is the original sound. Millions and millions of years ago, we started making noises like animals and all that. What happens when we speak, when we talk, when we sing? Our vocal cords, which are here, that we have two of them, they vibrate when we engage them. And according to what we do with the air that we pass through them, that will determine the quality of sound. So if I say, good evening, everybody, it sounds quite good. But if, <laughs> if let's say I speak too softly and I say something like, good evening, I lost you. Or if I force my sound, I say, good evening, everybody. That does not sound very beautiful, does it? What happened with that not very beautiful sound that I produced? I forced my vocal cords. I just forced them. And the moment we force sound, it stops being beautiful because we do not let the string or the vocal cord, whatever it is that we are trying to move, we are trying to move it. So we decided that pianists have to hit keys, which in turn hits the hammers. Now, piano is a fascinating instrument because the two hands on the piano do exactly the same thing. They play notes on the piano. It could not be farther from the truth if we look at string players because the left hand on the violin, viola, cello, bass, the left hand changes the pitch and the bow makes the sound. I always make a joke that as good as your left hand is, it does not, <laughs> it does not make for a good performance. Here, I'll give you my best performance with the left hand only. And I'm playing fantastic, even better than hyphens. Watch this. Great, isn't it? I did not miss one note. Thank you. It's very important to know that because when we learn the violin, we have to realize that our two hands, two arms do a completely different department of to-dos. And it's in practice, and when we practice them, we have to be very cognizant of that fact. So let's talk about the bow first. We start with, uh, with the technical part of playing the violin. Later in the program, I will also talk about making music, playing chamber music, etc. But for now, let's talk about sound production. How do we produce a wonderful sound on the violin? Well, the violin strings go from the bridge, the length of the string is from the bridge to the end of the peg box. And I'm sure you know that the tension near the bridge is quite high on the string and it gets quite low towards the bottom of the string. So because of physics and physical rules, we figured out that the best sound happens when we when you put the bow somewhere in between the bridge and the fingerboard. That is the best place to move the bow. So... So when we talk good sound, we have to make sure that no matter what we're playing, our bow will always be at approximately that spot on the violin. Because if I go much lower, we lose strength and we lose the body of the sound. On the other hand, if we go too close to the bridge, we get into some sounds that, shall we say, I don't like very much and probably neither do you. It's not beautiful. 
it just is not beautiful. Some of my students like to show off and they go to this side of the bridge. I say, look, Mr. Hammer. <laughs> it's a lot of fun seeing them trying to play the other side of the, of the, of the bridge. But anyway, this is, to me, the most important thing about playing the violin. And let me show you one of my favorite little things that, uh, okay, here it is. You will get it. I'm going to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star twice. First time I will play it perfectly with the left hand. Perfectly, in time, in tune. The sound will not be so great. Second time, I'll play the same twinkle, twinkle. Great sound, but I will miss a few notes. So you tell me what you think. Number one. Left hand was great, in time, in tune. Number two. And there we are. It is okay to miss a note, as far as I'm concerned. You give a concert, you give a performance, and you missed a few notes. If they all sounded beautiful, I'm okay with that. Very much okay with that. Much more than if I went to a concert and the person played most of the right notes, but the sound was, shall we say, not the best sound that that person can give us that night. So I know where my ears are, and uh, after, my <laughs> after my examples, I hope that you got the idea that, as far as I'm concerned, when I practice, I want every note to sound as beautiful as I possibly can make it, even when we play a scale. Make it sound beautiful, loud, soft, anything in the middle. So let's leave the bow and the sound for a moment and talk about the left hand. So left hand, everyone, by the way, everyone that I know practices the left hand much more than the bow. We always want to get the right notes. We want to get them quickly and as fast as we can and all that. So the position of the left hand on the violin is important if it is easy. We want to make sure we do not force here. You can see I'm pressing on the neck of the violin. That will not work. The only force that we can actually, if you call it a force, is when we press the fingers down on the string. Otherwise, we just play very easily. And one of the things that I'm asked a lot about is vibrato. Kids do it very sweetly. Says, Mr. Hammer, why do you shake your hand all the time when you play? <laughs> shake, yes, vibrato. So a quick vibrato study. And I promise you, you will get a beautiful vibrato if you do this. Take your left hand and move it back and forth like this. If it's a cello, of course, you do it this way. But just move the hand between first and third positions very easily, very smoothly. Once And look at, the, look at this, the whole arm is moving. If I put a finger down and I continue the same motion, watch that. That is vibrato. And let me show you what the finger does. I'll get a bit closer. When I do vibrato, look at my finger. It goes a little sharp and it goes a little flat. And that is what makes the vibrato. So it sounds like this. I'll do it very slowly. And that's a very nice, easy vibrato. If you practice it and you time it, I'll show you how the timing works. If you put the metronome on 60, you take four beats in a bow. One, two, three, four, one, two. Those are eight notes. Now we do triplets. Yeah. 
and then 16th notes. By the time you get to six or eight, you've got a beautiful slow vibrato. And of course, you can go faster if you like. You do this for, let's say, five minutes a day, you'll have a wonderful vibrato which is controlled, meaning that you'll be able to vary the speed of your vibrato. Another question that I'm asked a lot is, what about shifting? Because shifting is quite a, quite a challenging thing, especially when we have to make big shifts, small shifts. What happens and what are the best ways to do shifts? And I'm mentioning it immediately after vibrato because the motion is quite similar. So let's say I want to shift from first to third position. There are a couple of very important rules about shifting. Number one, slow moving. Make sure that you do not hurry. If you hurry a shift, chances are you, you miss it. Number two, time it beautifully. So at one, two, you arrive at two, and then three, four. And your wrist has to be easy when you shift. And it works even for big shifts. When you do a scale, shifts are the same when you're in very high positions. Look at my wrist. See the wrist opens up and there's a beautiful shift for you. Shifts I know are quite are quite challenging and I work on them a lot. So we have, let's see. We have a question from Jacob. Thank you so much. How do we relax the thumb? That's, that's a wonderful question. This is something, let me get closer to the camera. If the thumb is like this, whoops. It's too low. Make sure that the violin does, the neck does not go all the way down. Sort of about halfway. And when we shift, I like to shift without the thumb. Watch this. Can you see? I can move the thumb and that helps shifting. So watch how easy it becomes. Everyone can go like this, thumb can go on its own, fingers can go on their own. And thank you, Jacob, for bringing it up because I forgot to mention, in order to do any of these things, any, anything on the violin, or for that matter, also in sports, but we'll talk about sports later. The idea is to do whatever we do with as much ease as possible. So let me give you an example that has to do with numbers. I love numbers. Let's say to move the bow from here to here involves 15 muscles in my right arm, as an example. If I use 17 instead of the 15, I'm wasting energy and it does not help what I do with the bow. So as an example, if your thumb tends to be tight, make sure that as you practice, you pay attention to the thumb and somehow get it looser. You are the only one that can do it. I wish I could. <laughs> because of the pandemic, I can't even go and move anyone's shoulders. I love to do it with my students. Move the shoulder because the moment the shoulder is easy, we, have, we are halfway there. I hope that helped you a little bit. Jacob, and uh, now that we talked about vibrato and shifting, we come to scales and studies.
But before we do that, what is good practice? Has anyone given it some thought? Because we always talk practice, practice, practice. What is good practice? And of course, the most famous saying in the whole world, almost as famous as Einstein's E equals MC squared, the next one is practice makes perfect. Well, that is not true. And before you think that I'm just, that I lost my mind, let me explain. Practice means repetition. We have to repeat so that we get the thing right. So here is an example of a wonderful student like me who is trying to learn Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And I'm going to repeat it 500 times. I will not show you 500, but I'll show you about five. Are you ready? Even if I repeat that 7,000 times, I will never learn Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And that is because I'm not practicing correctly. I'm not repeating the correct moves. So if I may, I'd like to change that famous saying into the following. Good practice makes perfect. So remember that. It has to be correct before we start repeating it over and over and over again. And part of that correct is what I mentioned just a moment ago. It has to be easy. So my challenge to all of you, if you play a tough part and you repeat it second and third and fourth and fifth time, my challenge is make each of those repeats easier. Two will be easier than one. Three will be easier than two. The easier it becomes, the better it will sound. Promise. This is an absolutely 100% Guarantee promise. About 10, 12 years, uh, 12 years ago, there was a famous study. I think it was done in Switzerland. They invited 20 pianists, half were professional, half were amateur. They put them in 20 different rooms. Each pianist got the same three or four lines of music brand new piece, no one knew it. And their challenge was to learn these three or four lines of music. They were given, I think, one hour. And after the hour of practice, each of those pianists came out and recorded the piece as they practiced it. Some pianists, of course, played it better, some pianists not as well. The the whole idea behind the study was to talk to people about how they practice. And this is fascinating. The 20 pianists had various ideas. It was not all the same besides one aspect. All 20 pianists practiced slowly. Slowly. And the reason is very simple. I'll bring you the example from driving. If we drive at 20 kilometers an hour and we have to stop suddenly, we'll do it quite well. If we have to stop at 80 kilometers an hour, it's not going to be as easy and we're going to travel a much longer distance before we manage to control the car. When we practice slowly, even very tough parts, you can do Paganini, the hardest Paganini that you can imagine. If you do it slow enough, you can do it. It's that simple. There's time. There really is time, even if you do uh, something like that. It looks amazingly hard if you do it slowly. Easy. 
So slow practice is the most important thing there is. Some of the other aspects of practicing, now I'll talk about them mentioning Kreutzer. We talked about scales and studies. Why do we do scales and studies? I remember when I was a kid, I did not like to do scales and studies. I just wanted to do Mendelssohn and Bach and Schubert and Mozart. Why do we do studies and scales and all that? And I love Beethoven and his music. And if you listen to Beethoven, you will notice that probably half his pieces are scales and arpeggios. I'm sure you know the violin concerto. One of the main tunes is this. Two scale. And it's one of the most beautiful pieces that, uh, that have ever been written. It's a great piece of music. Scales for you. So if you want to play Beethoven, practice scales, practice arpeggios. It's filled. And when you look at piano music, arpeggios galore, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, all those amazing composers. It's the basis of music, scales and arpeggios. So, some ideas for practicing. Some ideas besides slow, of course. Let's take Irish washerwoman. Couple of ideas. Number one, I would take the first bar and do it slowly, just repeat. With special attention to string crossing, because we only cross for one note. Do that maybe 10 times, not too fast. Then do second bar. And then put the two bars together. An example. If you like, you can add some rhythms. Or if you like rhythms, you can slur. Make up your own ideas for variations. And the reason I mentioned Kreutzer, everybody knows Kreutzer, study number two. Everybody knows that. And if you practice that study, the first, I think, six or seven or eight lines of it, Mr. Kreutzer gave you 20 or 30 variations. And those variations are invaluable, absolutely invaluable. He wants you to do it with different bowings. And some are quite jazzy. All sorts of fascinating, and one which is very uh, bouncy. sorts of phenomenal variations. I, if you have not done it yet, do study number two Kreutzer, learn it by heart. It's a great study, great, great study. And then do the variations that are in the page and make up some more. You can make up different bowings, make up different rhythms, anything that you want to do. Have fun with it. It's a great, great study. So, to finish this chapter on practice, because it's a very important one, good practice makes perfect.
And by good practice, I would like to change it to the word intention. What are your intentions when you sit down or stand up to practice? What, what, what would you like to do? What exactly would you like to reach? By the way, have you figured uh, out what good practice actually means? What is a good, good practice? I'll tell you what I think. Good practice is when we learn a piece of music really well in as short a time as we can. Why am I saying that? If everyone would be given 50 years to learn the Beethoven concerto, piece of cake, 50 years. Hey, I can learn one note a day and I'll do it in 50 years. No, we want to learn it maybe in six months. So if we want to learn the Beethoven or Mozart or Schubert in, in a relatively short time and we want to play it well, we'd better practice with very, very clear intentions. And just to repeat, the main words for good practice is slow, easy, simplify. Make it simple. Work on rhythms, work on bowings. And these are just some of the ideas of practice. Before we go into the musical part on what do we do with all this amazing skill or amazing skills, of playing the violin, I would like to just uh, play a little jig by Bach. This is jig from the E major partita. And here we go. Let's pretend we live about 300 years ago. I'm playing in the corner of the room and you guys are all dancing the jig. this jig I don't think uh, it would be very good for dancing because I kept changing little rhythms here and there but you can imagine how how it would go if I played it strictly in two or six eight as it happens so that was Bach good old Mr. Bach so before we go on any questions any comments about uh, some of the skills and technique aspects of playing the violin. Well, we have Eric and Eric says, hi Eric. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for your kind words, Eric. <laughs> Thank you so much. Are you a I, I trust you're a violinist, Eric. Otherwise, maybe you wouldn't be here. That's great. I'm so glad that you're here. But now that we went into the performance part of music, what, what do we do with all these skills when, then we, when we prepare for a concert? So to me, going on stage or being here in front of the camera with everyone, what is it that I want to, to tell you when I play this Bach for you? What is it? Do I just stand here and play? 
what is it? What, what, what do I do with Bach or Mozart or, or Schubert? What is it? I call it very simply a story. I'm here to tell you my story of how Mr. Bach wrote this jig. That's my way of seeing his jig. So I'm telling you a story. How do I tell you a fun story? How do I tell you a story that you do not fall asleep? And that's a good question because many people, like I knew a guy who said, right at this moment, I'm so excited. I could jump off the roof. So that would not be a very interesting story, but it's a story. And let me just check what's happening. We have Lucy. Oh, Lucy's asking a good question. How do I know when to play up or down bow? Well, that's part of music, so I'll talk about it in a sec. This is for all of you that are interested. This is a down bow, we go this way. And this is an up bow. I never knew why we call it up and down in English, but there you go. The, the, these signs, the up, up is like a V sign, and the down bow is like a, a sideways C or something like that. So it depends. It really depends. If, if we, let me put it to you this way. I would start 90% of the pieces with the down bow. The ones that I don't, the ones that I start with an up bow, like the bath that we just did, because the first note is an upbeat. So, it's an up bow. But if it's, uh, let's say, twinkle, it starts on the first beat. Down bow. So most of the time. And actually, Lucy, if you like to uh, answer yourself, I suggest, I invite you to, when you practice, practice it both ways and see which one you like more. You can start a scale up bow or down bow. You can make it sound the same. Or if you like one more than the other, go for it. Everything is about experimentation. I like to ask kids uh, who say, oh, I don't know how to do it. I say, well, what's your favorite ice cream? And they say, oh, strawberry. I said, how do you know? I say, oh, we tried a few. Aha, uh -huh. there you are. Experiment. And I promise you, you will find one flavor that appeals to you more than the others. So story, we were talking about a story and how to make a story interesting. I will look, we've got one more question here, and then I'll tell you the story with Clayton. Clayton wants to know how I hold the violin how to hold the violin. Well, thank you, Clayton. I'll show it to you with a hand. I'm holding the violin this way, watch. Imagine that I'm holding it with my thumb underneath and with the fingers above. That's how we hold the violin, okay? Remember that. So, the thumb is my shoulder. I, I, I call that a sofa. So look at the sofa, the violin rests on the sofa. I turn my head so that the chin lines up with the chin rest. So we turn the head sideways to the left and the head goes down. So let's see if I can show you what it looks like over here. Can you see that? Shoulder supports it from the bottom and the head, the wrist holds it from above. Some people like to have a chin rest like this, but some people like to have the chin rest more in the middle of the violin. That is your preference because you asked me how to do it. Experiment. Use one of these chin rests where your, your chin is on the side and maybe get one where the chin is a little bit more centered. I know some people like it this way. 
it all has to do with your preference and how your bow lines up. Because if you hold the violin this way, look, then the bow may go a little bit crooked. Make sure that the bow always is at 90 degrees to the violin. Sorry, 90 degrees to the strength of the violin. So let's talk about stories and what makes stories interesting. And we'll go back to Twinkle. I love Twinkle. I love Twinkle. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Babies, we were all babies, when we learn how to talk, it's, it's the most fascinating thing for me because what babies do as they learn to talk is they practice. I don't know if we look at it that way, but babies practice how to talk. Babies practice how to walk. And I love it because babies, when they reach a certain age, they don't breathe in the right spots. So I love it when a two-year-old comes and says, oh, I, I, I want to go to the park. <laughs> or I want to go to the park. <laughs> Breathing in, I don't want to say inappropriate, but as we get older, we do not breathe at those spots. We, we say, I want to go to the park without breathing because it makes much more sense. So here is my example on how we tell a story. We are given notes. Notes are like letters. And we put the notes into words and into sentences. So if we talk in words, it still does not make much sense. I want to go to the park just doesn't make sense. In order to make sense, we have to make a sentence. I want to go to the park. So here's an example in music, and Twinkle is, is fantastic. I will play every note of Twinkle exactly the same as all the others. I don't think anyone was moved by this performance. D, D, A, A, B, B, A. Big deal. So you tell me, so tell me how you feel about this piece, not just about the notes. So let's say, instead of playing 4-4, four, four, which this piece is written in, I'll give it a pulse, every one and every three. So it will sound like this. <laughs> That's a little bit better, isn't it? Just a little. It still does not make a lot of sense as a sentence. How about we make one pulse per bar? What do you think? Is it getting a little bit better? I think so. But now let me tell you my story. This is how I feel about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Ready? I'm sure you were touched because I told you a little mini story. How did I do that? And if you want to really understand how something like this happens, do think of a baby talking. It's, it's, it's understanding the structure of sentences. How do we put them together? So as an example, I can say, good morning, everybody. Or I can say, good morning, everybody. I can say, good morning, everybody. I use the same words. And there were three stories there. This is how we make music. We take the notes. We learn them beautifully. So they sound absolutely amazing. And then we shape them. We shape them into beautiful sentences. Like I showed you as an example with, with uh, Twinkle Twinkle. 
Let me give you some ideas on how to do that. How do we make different sounds? So of, the obvious one is dynamics. We can play loud and we can play soft and we can get louder and we can get softer. So in twinkle, we can get louder from the bottom. We got a little bit louder and then we get softer from the G. So we built a little mountain or a hill. We went a little higher and then we came down. That makes a lot of sense because we usually say good morning. Very rarely do we say good morning. Doesn't sound right. Pay attention to how, how people talk, how we talk. How do we shape our sentences? It's not just going up at the end of the question, like, what time is it? What time is it? How do we do that? So here are some of the, of the ways to do it besides dynamics. We can build tension and then release it. How do we do that? So as an example, vibrato. Watch this. If I take vibrato and I go from slow vibrato to fast vibrato, it creates tension. So maybe we'll leave Twinkle Twinkle at home by now. But how about we do uh, this, I'm sure you know this piece. Meditation by, by Massenet. So if I start on the F sharp with slow vibrato, that's quite relaxed. And that's beautiful. If I started with very fast vibrato, I don't think you'll be very easy going. If I go like this. You always say, what's happening? You had too much coffee or something like that. Just calm down, right? There's one way to build tension with vibrato so I can start slow. And... And then less. So I built a nice little hill a couple of times up and down, and I helped the crescendo with faster vibrato. It builds tension. The last good movie that you watched, think back at the movie. How does or how did the director build the tension in the movie? And this is one way where we build tension in music and then we relax it. And then it feels like a great story. And mainly it's not just one hill going up and one hill coming down. In music, even in a short piece, there are many little hills, many. So we'll go up and down and up and down and then we build to a big tension and then we come down. And usually that's the end of the piece, usually. So let me see. We have got some questions from our lovely audience. We have a question from Don. Oh, that's wonderful. Congratulations, Don. You're back to the violin after 30 years. That's terrific. Terrific. I have a few students who, I just have a new student who also has, didn't play for, for about the same amount of time and is coming back. It's, it's not like riding a bike. We have to learn how to do things. You're right. What happens when we get younger, our hands are getting less supple. We, 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 our fingers are not moving as easy. Just, they don't move as easily as they used to. Um, my, my main thought, as far as you're, you're concerned, is Make sure that you practice slowly with patience, a lot of patience, because your fingers do still have the memory, I promise. They still have memory. But you need to cajole your fingers and hand and bow to cajole them to remembering those things. Warm up. Make sure that you warm up. Do not go very quickly into fast 
exercises. Just maybe do slow scales, like maybe four beats each. And be sure to, to follow the easy part. Remember I talked about being easy? Continue to be easy. If you force your hands or elbows or shoulders, it's going to be that much harder. So good luck. Good luck. It, it must be a lot of fun. Now, thank you, Don. We have a question from Nigel who wants to know what my thoughts are about shoulder rests. Well, that's very simple, Nigel. Very simple. Some people have longer necks and some people have shorter necks. My neck is quite short, so I play without a shoulder rest. But I know many people who have higher necks, you just use a shoulder. It's that simple. Because we do not want, let me show you, we do not want to raise the left shoulder in order to hold the violin. That will create a lot of tension in the body. So if you have a long neck, by all means, do use a shoulder rest. It makes it much easier. When I was a kid, I started playing with a shoulder rest, but once I grew, I realized that my, <laughs> my neck is quite short. So thank you, Nigel. We have a question from, do I read it right? Rai Rai or Riri? <laughs> Any recommendations for practicing with less tension? Bow. Yes. That's, that's fantastic. You, you, you actually called the name of the game, I think. So here is my one sentence that if you learn how to do that, you're going to be great. Promise. How about we consider the strings on the violin as if they are alive? And no, I, am, I did not lose my mind. The strings, obviously, they are not alive. Nothing happens now. They come alive when I touch them. Think about it. So your strings are just completely inanimate. The moment you touch them with the bow, they come alive. They do, because they vibrate and they make a sound. You asked me how to make sure that your right hand is easy. So very simply, hold the bow with as much ease as you can. I don't know if you see. Maybe play with the violin this way. Sorry, with the bow. Tilt it. Play with the fingers. Put your little finger on the bow. Tilt it this way. Engage each finger. See how it feels. And I always think that I love my bow and I caress it because I love to hold it. So caress the bow. Now here comes the crux of the matter. Why did I mention touching the strings and they come alive? Is here is the equation. I love, I love math and equations. The violin will give you the sound that you produce the same way that you touch the string. So let me show you. If I take the bow and I slap the string, watch this. <coughs> Slapped it, right? That was not a good sound whatsoever at all. If I touch the string with care, I truly care. So when I go to the string, I literally caress it. Or we go back to the Thais, Masne. So I touch the string so gently because I care about the string. So my promise to everybody, if you take the bow, hold it gently, hold it with care, and touch the string with the utmost care that you can imagine. Even when you play forte, even when you play loud, I promise you're going to play with the most beautiful sound that you can. Promise. 
This is this is my promise to everybody. So back to where we started, which is sound. <laughs> How do we play chamber music? Because we play with two, three, four other people, not during pandemic, but hopefully we'll be able to do it in, in a few months, play with other people again. How do we make music? How do we make good music together? And I like, again, to go back to the piano. If you listen to a pianist practice, a good pianist will constantly balance the chords, constantly. If they have six notes in a chord, as an example, they will choose a note to bring out, mainly the top one, mainly. And the other notes will support this one note, which is the most important note. Same goes for chain music. If you do a quartet, as an example, and you're playing four notes at the same time, we want to balance the chord so that the most important note comes to the four. The other three instruments support it. I cannot play four or five notes on the violin, but I can do two notes. And I'll show you that when I do this, which is C, E, I can play more E. I can play more C by moving the bow a little bit towards the G string or a little bit more towards the D string. In this case, I want to play the E a little more because that's the tune. towards the note that is important. So this is about balancing the chords. One other very important thing about the bow, I love talking about the bows, you notice, and about sound. How do we create colors? I call it colors. One of the amazing things about computers, before computers we had, let's say what, four different reds? We had a blue red, a, a brown red, a, pink, red, whatever. With a computer, we have 7 million reds. Any red that you like. Same for blues and greens, etc. How do we create those colors on violin? I'll give you a few, a few hints. And please experiment, because to me, this is the most exciting part of learning a piece. How do I choose a color? So let's take a D scale, and we're going to play it one note to bow, and I will use about this much bow on each note. So, now I'm going to use twice as much bow as I just did and listen to the difference in sound. It's also a nice sound, but totally different. So if I play a scale in a piece, which one will I choose? And that is where experimentation comes in. So let's take a piece like, okay, we go back to the meditation. Am I going to use this sound? Or will I use this sound? sound, which one experiment with both. Yes. And maybe tomorrow night I will feel like a different type of red. Again, maybe tomorrow night I'll play differently. And this is the beauty of creativity. So actually learning how to make music is the most fun part. I promise. Once you do it and you start experimenting with combinations of sounds, maybe a little bit louder, a little bit more crescendo, a little bit more diminuendo, maybe a little bit more bow, maybe a different part of the bow. Maybe you can do the same scale that you did here. You can do it a little lower in the bow. Again, 
again, it sounds different. So I'm developing more and more reds and blues and greens. Do the same. This is truly fantastic. I let me tell you, I am. Uh, I've played the violin most of my life and made music most of my life. If I live to be twice as old as I am now, I will continue to play music and play the violin because it's fascinating and it's exciting. It truly, truly is exciting. And let me have a look at Jane. Do I recommend learning pieces by reading the music and also learning it by memory? Yes and yes. Um, the way I practice, and I think it will happen to you as well, if you do enough repetition as you learn the piece, you will know it by heart in no time. Promise. You, you will not be able to help it because if you repeat something 10 times or 20 times, you know it by heart. The, the, the word of caution is make sure you practice small parts of the music. I don't think you can memorize a piece by playing the whole page from beginning to end. That would be quite challenging. Maybe take four bars at the, at the beginning and play them a few times. Maybe two bars. Your choice. But small segments and put them together. Two bars, two bars, two bars, and then put them together into four bars and four bars. Makes it easier, and our brain can learn easier when we do short stints. So, ladies and gentlemen, it was a lot of fun talking to you, and I hope that one of these days we'll be able to meet face to face and we can all see each other safely without masks. Thank you, Adam, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, I wish you a good evening. <laughs>